Christmas, everybody. You guys, you guys look really lovely. This is actually amazing to see all of you guys here. Uh, wow, amazing. So I've got a question for the kids in the room. All right, so kids, I need you to help me answer this question. Miles is ready. Uh, all right, here's the question. What is it that makes you individually, what makes you special or unique? Who has uh, something that maybe is only to you, maybe something you're really good at or something you know a lot about? Yes. What makes you special? I'm really good with horses. You're really good with horses? That's amazing. Awesome. What about you, Miles? I'm basically a dog whisperer. You're basically a dog whisperer, and I can tell you, I've seen you talk to my puppy Cleo, and she just loves you so much, so I can attest to that one. What else? Who else has got something? Yes. You're really, really good at art. That's incredible. That's incredible. All right, one more, one more. Who, who's, yes? My mom says I'm really great at art. You're also really great at art, according to your mom. Do you think you're great at art? Yes, you are. Okay, all right, that's awesome. So today, what I want to talk about is something that is at first going to seem like it has nothing to do with Christmas, and you're going to be very confused, and you're going to be like, why did I come all the way here? If you're not going to talk about Christmas, I promise it's connected. But we are going to look at a story in which uh, a lot of very unique, very special people bring what they have, their, their gifts and their talents, to God in worship. Now, kids, you should have received some coloring stuff, uh, and maybe this sheet of paper, this, this guy, this has... First of all, a place what I'd love for you guys to just write down, and maybe after the service you can show me, write down what it is that makes you special, because I know you didn't all get a chance to speak. And second, if you want to color in this picture, it's going to give you a little bit of a clue as to what we'll be talking about and how it has something to do with Christmas a little bit later. So, friends, we are going to talk again about a story you're not expecting for Christmas Eve. It comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 60, starting in verse, uh, verse 1. So if you want to grab a Bible in the seats in front of you, you can. It's going to be page 615. You can look it up in our app, on a, your own Bible, whatever you'd like. But I'm going to tell you this, this prophecy, this story, this vision that the prophet Isaiah had that I think absolutely is appropriate for where we are today. So go ahead and turn there. And while you're turning there, let me just give you a little bit of context, because we don't always talk about the prophets. The Old Testament prophets can be kind of weird. We don't always go there. But I want you to understand that when this prophecy was first written, was first spoken, there was a very specific thing happening in Israel at the time. Israel, the people of God, they were going through a really rough spot. You see, Israel, for the, for the tens and hundreds and several hundreds of years before this moment, they had been having basically one defeat after another. A bunch of enemy nations kept invading. Uh, a lot of the people of Israel got scattered all across the globe. They were all over the place. And frankly, eventually, it ultimately culminated with the Babylonian army coming into Jerusalem and destroying the temple, God's temple, and carrying off a lot of the elite from Israel off into exile far from home. Now, Years later, the Israelites, some of them were able to come back to Jerusalem, and they started trying to rebuild, and they did rebuild the temple, God's house, but everything that they were rebuilding, including the temple, didn't hold a candle to what came before. It felt like they were just barely living in the shadow of their former glory. And so people of Israel were super discouraged. When will this come to an end? Is there any hope? And into that moment, Isaiah spoke this message with the Holy Spirit's uh, voice through him. Here's what he said. Arise, Jerusalem. Let your light shine for all to see. For the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth. But the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Look, look and see, for everyone is coming home. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your little daughters will be carried home. Your eyes will shine and your heart will thrill with joy. For merchants from around the world will come to you. They will bring you the wealth of many lands. Vast caravans of camels will converge on you. The camels of Midian and Ephah. The people of Sheba will bring gold and frankincense and will come worshiping the Lord. The flocks of Kedar will be given to you, and the rams of Nebaioth will be brought for my altars. I will accept their offerings, and I will make my temple glorious. 
Okay, it goes on, but isn't that just beautiful? I mean, I think it is. Maybe I'm a Bible nerd, but my goodness, I find that so profound. As it goes on, I won't read the whole thing, but you see the ships of Tarshish show up, and they're bringing back all these scattered Israelites across the ocean. Well, the ships of Tarshish everywhere else in the Bible are the bad guys, And all of a sudden, now they're helping out. They're bringing the people of Israel home. A bit later, you see that foreign builders come from around the world to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, and and they're all using their skills and gifts to make it beautiful. And I imagine, you know, carpenters and stonemasons and artists, everybody's coming to Jerusalem to worship God with what they have. And as a result of this, this unity, everybody's coming together. There's no more violence, of course. There's no more war. And it's as if there's no more suffering or pain because everybody is one. Frankly, it is peace on earth. It's peace on earth. That is what Isaiah 60 captures. But remember, and I've I've talked about this a lot in this series, biblical peace, when we're talking about peace from Scripture, it is way more than just an absence of warfare, right? When you see peace in the Bible, God's peace, it's not just an absence of violence. God's peace means life. It means wholeness and completeness. Frankly, it means a return to the Garden of Eden, where God's presence is there, where there's enough, where there's harmony. That is what God's peace is. And we see those same things happening in this story as well. We see life, we see abundance, we see joy, celebration, and Frankly, it's like we're seeing a new Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem that's becoming like a new Garden of Eden. Everybody's bringing everything they have to make it beautiful. And what I love about this prophecy is that the whole world shows up, right? Everybody shows up in this. You've got every tribe, every nation, every people group, every ethnicity. They're all flooding to Jerusalem to worship God. Verse 3 says, all nations, all nations will come to your light. But don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is important. Yes, all the people here are unified in their worship of God. They're all one and the same in that. But when they come to Jerusalem, it does not involve having all of their uniqueness and their cultural identity stripped away. Just the opposite. No, they're they're, they're all bringing their uniqueness, what makes them one of a kind, each different culture, each nationality. They're coming to God in worship. Like, for example, those those, uh, foreign builders I mentioned, when I see this, vi- this vision of, of peace on earth, I picture, I picture builders bringing different cultural uh, designs, and, and I, ca- I can picture Greek stonemasons building beautiful columns, and I see, I see Japanese uh, woodworkers using this, their perfect joinery on the temple. I imagine African design and Asian. It's, it, it's beautiful, right? It's, it's, it's incredible. And what we see in this is we see that everybody, uh, verse 5, merchants from around the world will come to you. They'll bring you the wealth of many lands. So you've got camels from this area and sheep from here, gold from here, lumber from here. It's all from around the world. Kids, help me out. What are some other things that might be coming to Jerusalem? If it's from all over the world, what might people be bringing? Throw it out. What do you got? Miles, what do you got? Diamonds. Diamonds. Amazing. What else would be coming to Jerusalem if it was from all over the world? Go ahead. What? Shout it out. Yeah, that's a great one. From Germany, there might be some decorations. That's amazing. Maeve, what you got? Coins. Coins? Of course. There'd be coins. It'd be amazing. It'd be beautiful. Thank you, kids. Oh, yes. One more. We are, we are a little embarrassed. That's okay. What, what do we got? You going to yell it out? <laughs> Candy canes? Absolutely. <laughs> Guys, that was worth the wait. Candy canes are definitely in this vision, right? So you get the idea. Every culture, every people group is bringing their very best to God. It is beautiful. And frankly, this is what I love to think about when I consider what's coming. Because this is a vision of peace on earth, and this is what God promises us. This is what is on the way. All nations worshiping him as one. And guys, guess what? On the night that Jesus was born, this is what the angels declared to be true. They said this in the Gospel of Luke. They said, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth. Peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. According to these angels, all of this vision of, of peace was starting to come true. Isaiah 60 was already, was already here. Except there's a problem with that because it isn't, right? I mean, 
it's been 2,000 years and there's still war and there's still violence and there's still bullies at school and people don't like each other, right? So, so this is a kind of an issue that we have to think about. If the angels said, peace on earth is here, but it's not, then were they wrong? Did the angels miss, miss something? Did they get it wrong, mess it up a little bit? Did, they, did the choir of angels come in too early? What happened here? Well, in a moment, I'm going to come back and we'll see if we can answer that question. That was awesome, Tim and Jennifer. Thank you. That was amazing. Okay, so we left off asking the question, were the angels wrong? When they said there's peace on earth, were they wrong? Did they get it wrong? Well, I don't think they were. And I'm going to try to show you why. Uh, and we got to go back to Isaiah 60 for a second, and this is why I think they weren't wrong. So I want to point out one little detail. I read over it pretty quickly. You might have missed it, but I just want to show you one little thing. Uh, first of all, in, in verse 3, it does say, All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Okay, so you got the idea that all these, these rulers from around the world are coming to the light. And it goes on that they are bearing these, these extravagant gifts, right? Verse 6 says, The people of Sheba will bring gold and frankincense and will come worshiping the Lord. So don't miss this. First of all, Sheba is this, this Arabian kingdom out to the east of Israel. And, and they were very wealthy. They had precious metals and spices and, and incense and all kinds of really good stuff. And it says that they come not only bearing these gifts, but worshiping the Lord. So here's why I point this out. Let's look at what we've got here. We've got four things to pay attention to. Number one, we've got visitors from the east, foreigners from the east. We've got them uh, coming to God's light, 
They're coming to the light. They're bearing gifts of gold and frankincense, and they are worshiping the Lord. Does that ring a bell to any of you at all? Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men, some magi from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. The star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and they gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now that sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? You got foreigners from the east coming to God's light. They're coming to the star of Jesus. They're bearing gifts of gold and frankincense, and ultimately they are worshiping the Lord. That is exactly what we see happening in Isaiah 60. Is this just a coincidence? Is it just a coincidence? I don't think so, because frankly, that's not how the Bible works. Honestly, I'm a Bible nerd, and I'll tell you, you don't see a lot of coincidences. There's a lot of intentionality here. I think what Matthew, who wrote that story, what he wants us to see is that the vision of peace on earth from Isaiah 60, that it began, that prophecy began to come true with the birth of Christ. Peace on earth had begun, and the visiting magi were just the first taste of it. I mean, think about what happened next in the story. As Jesus grew up and began teaching, you had Samaritans who were Israel's next door neighbors. They started to follow him and believe, right? And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit allowed Jesus' followers to speak in all these different languages. And you just happened to have visitors, Jewish visitors from all over the world who, who were there. They heard the gospel in their language and they took it back home with them. And in just a couple of years, you had Gentiles, everyone else on earth who was welcomed into the family of God. And it did not take long for that message of Jesus, that message of peace to start spreading to every corner of the earth. People, nations, cultures were streaming, not to a literal Jerusalem, not to the the literal physical temple, but into the new temple, the center of God's presence on the earth, Jesus himself. Isaiah 60 was beginning to come true more and more every single day. And think about what Jesus accomplished through his teachings and through his death and his resurrection. The, the, the sin and brokenness and depravity of humanity that, that leads to war and violence, it now has been done away with and we can begin to live into it and, and live in a kingdom where there is no violence. The kingdom of God, there is no violence. We can return to Eden. We can begin to experience it and even spread it in our lives. The light of God has come. And all nations can worship him together. Isaiah 60 is coming true in our world. And it began with the birth of Jesus on Christmas morning. Now, is the prophecy fulfilled yet? Is it all the way done? No, of course not. No, the world is still broken. There is still violence. There there is still time to go before all of this comes true. However, however, what I want you to hear today is that because of what began with the birth of Jesus, you and I, we don't have to live in the brokenness anymore. We can begin to be a part of its healing. We can begin being a part of this vision of new creation, of every nation coming to worship God. It's possible because of who is leading us. Isaiah 60 has this this verse in verse 17. says, I will make peace your leader and righteousness your ruler. Well, we now have a ruler whose name is Jesus. We call him the Prince of Peace. He's our ruler. He is our leader. He's making all things right. The doors of Jerusalem are open for anyone. And we can now walk right in and the light of God shines brightly. Why would we not? If that was the case, why would we not want to go to him with everything that we have, everything that makes us unique, every gift that we could possibly offer him? Why would we not do that in worship and love because of what he has done and what he is doing? So no, the angels weren't wrong. Peace on earth is not just some idea. It's not some some future hope. It is beginning to break into our world. It started on Christmas morning. 
Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Peace on earth has begun. Now, that's a very nice theological statement that I just made. How do you experience it? How do you actually begin to live into that peace? Well, all month at Grace, we've been talking about this idea of peace on earth. We've talked about what is it like? How do you experience God's peace? And if you remember, we began in our hearts. How do we experience it just right here? The answer is by by acknowledging that through the birth of Jesus, we know now that the Lord is near, right? God is with us. We are no longer alone. That's what the name Emmanuel means, God with us. So we can experience some of that peace because in our hearts we know that we are not alone in this. In our families we can experience peace on earth by by beginning to live into the self-giving love of Jesus, right? He set himself aside by becoming this, this human child. We can learn to set ourselves aside and in the process we can love our family and bring peace even if sometimes our family feels a bit like warfare. We can be the source of God's peace in our families. And then last week, we talked about the really difficult tribalism that's going on in our culture today. And we talked about how we can learn to be transformed. We can allow the Holy Spirit to transform us into new people, new people, the kinds of people who don't uh, put our tribes first and foremost, but instead put Christ and our love for each other. That comes first. We can have peace in our hearts, in our families, and in our community. Well, today, all I want to do is add one little final puzzle piece to that, taking it all the way out to peace on earth, peace in our world. How do we experience that? I would argue that we experience that by beginning to live as if Isaiah 60 is coming true now. Begin to live as if this prophecy is actually happening. Here's what I mean. Two specific things. First of all, we can live like everybody is welcome at the table. Live like everybody is welcome. In Isaiah's vision, right, every nation is coming to God in worship. Different cultures, different uh, languages. There's strong nations. There's weak nations. There's former enemies. Everybody's on their way. Old conflicts are forgotten. War has no place because everybody has their eyes focused on the light. And everyone is welcome. Everybody is welcome there. Now that Christ has come, now that he has shown us the way of peace, we can start living like that's true. Actually living like every person we encounter deserves to be at the table. We can make room in our hearts. We can make room in our lives for those who are different than us. We can begin to set aside our old grudges, to throw our prejudice in the trash. We can live like everybody, regardless of their their opinions, regardless of their, their culture, regardless of their abilities, that everybody is welcome at this table. Because in the kingdom of God, guys, they are. They are welcome. Live like Isaiah 60 is true and start to live like everybody is welcome. The second way that we do that, though, to experience the peace on earth is to cherish the unique gifts that others bring. Again, in Isaiah 60, we see all the nations bringing their very best in worship. We see the Magi showing up to worship Jesus, bringing literally the finest gifts that they could even think of from their region, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We can do the same. In this vision of peace on earth in Isaiah 60, yeah, everybody's welcome at the table. And frankly, it's a beautiful, unifying thing, right? All of us are exactly the same in our brokenness, in our sin. We are no different from one another. We're all just the same. We're one. And we are all just the same, and we are all one in the redemption that we experience and the grace that we experience in Jesus. So we are all one. That's true. We're all welcome at the table. But Isaiah 60 and the story of the Magi reminds us that, that when we come to Christ, our, our uniqueness is not stripped away but exactly the opposite. It's our our uniqueness and the, the, the specific ways that God has designed us. Those are the things that we can bring to him in worship as we become who we truly are because God is the one who made us unique. God made us unique. Kids, when you're telling me all the things that you can do, the art, the, the, the things that make you so special, God is the one who gave you those gifts. In the kingdom of God, we are unique and we are unified. We're all just alike in our sin, but we are all one of a kind in our design. The birth of Jesus is a reminder that every individual, every family, 
every culture, every nationality, every ethnicity, every ability level, everybody carries a unique spark of God's character and we are not complete until all of these gifts are represented. That is the vision that we see here. If we want to truly fulfill this this vision of peace on earth this Christmas, then we've got some work to do. We've got to learn how to not only welcome everybody at the table. That takes some work, guys. That's what we've been talking about, loving others that are different than us. That is not easy. It takes work, but we can do it. We can live like Isaiah 60 is true. And two, we can cherish the gifts that others bring. Cherish the uniqueness and celebrate how beautiful and unique God has made every human soul. The Magi, they started this pilgrimage of peace. I think it's time that we start joining the caravan, don't you? The Lord is near. Peace on earth has begun. I say we learn how to live like that's true. Would you pray with me? Well, Father, this is a, an astounding vision. When we really truly think about what you have done for us, what you have made possible in this divided and broken world, the fact that you would invite us to return with you to this garden of peace, this garden of Eden, this life that you have in store for us, it's humbling. And yet, Father, I know that you delight in having us join you in this mission. So my prayer, God, for all of us this Christmas is that we would not have too small a vision of what you have in store for this world, but instead that we would be transformed by what you have already begun and that we would join in and begin healing this world in your name. Father, we love you and we pray these things in the name of Jesus who showed us the way of peace. Amen. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.